Russia is one of the very few countries where domestic internet brands are stronger than global ones. Unlike China, they were not helped by the government. They grew completely independently. And yet, Russian government authorities have succeeded in developing a strong and sophisticated system to repress internet freedoms. How does the Russian online community respond to the challenge of digital authoritarianism? And who is winning this battle? These are the topics this video will address. The evolution of the Russian state's approach to internet governance over the past decade points to a decisive shift towards networked authoritarianism. This concept was coined by scholar Rebecca McKinnon, and it provides a helpful frame to understand the context in Russia today. Uh, so as a networked authoritarian state, Russia is overall highly supportive of technological innovation and readily invests into national digital infrastructure and IT development. At the same time, Russian laws and policies governing the internet have become increasingly restrictive and controlling, uh, relying on the very same technologies to usurp the power over digital spaces, data flows, and citizens' online agency. Um, under the pretext of ensuring national security and protection from external threats, Russian authorities have cracked down on online expression, silenced most independent media, and have gained the ability to filter undesirable content or even block social media platforms wholesale, as we've seen with Twitter and Facebook. Uh, these restrictions escalated sharply with the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in early 2022, and will uh, likely lead to an even more isolated and controlled Russian internet, given the country's growing exclusion from the global stage. The Soviet Union was ruled by the Communist Party, a strictly hierarchical structure which controlled all spheres of Soviet life. In particular, public speech, written or oral, was subject to prior control by communist censors. Control over information was essential to the Soviet model, which relied on restricting what people could say or read. But access to modern communications means horizontal ties. That is, people talking to people and exchanging news and ideas. The Internet is a horizontal creature by default, and it clashed with the Soviet approach almost from the moment it arrived in the Soviet Union in 1990. The Runet, Russian Internet, started as a small local network in the top-secret Kurchatov Institute for Nuclear Research in Moscow. In the summer of 1991, during the communist coup, KGB plotters attempted to oust Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and reverse the democratic reforms that he had launched. Tanks and troops were sent to Moscow, and the KGB tried to reinforce strict censorship. But there was already a tiny communications network connecting Soviet researchers with their peers in the West. The network was run from two offices, one of them in the Kurchatov Institute. It was called RALCOM, Reliable Communication, and it was then mostly dial-up connection, slow and unreliable, but enough to exchange emails. RELCOM became the first tool to spread information about the putsch, reporting inside the country and to the West on people's reactions and troops' movements. The August 1991 coup failed after just a couple of days, and for the next 20 years the Internet in Russia developed freely and without censorship. Russian security services tried to put it under some sort of control by forcing all Internet service providers to install black boxes on their networks. These black boxes, known as SORM from the System of Operative Research Measures, provided backdoor access for the Russian secret services to all Russian communications, including the Internet. But in practice, this measure did not interfere with free communication, and Russian Internet users could still participate in the information exchange without authorization. Despite being a trained KGB officer, and thus by definition suspicious of uncontrolled communication, Vladimir Putin at first underestimated the challenge to his power posed by the Internet. This backfired for the Kremlin in 2011 and 2012 during mass street protests, first and foremost in Moscow, which were organized via Facebook and other social media. The protests brought together up to 100,000 people and frightened Putin and his entourage. The Kremlin began an offensive against the Runet in the summer of 2012. It started with the introduction of nationwide blacklists of sites, pages, and URLs, the first system of internet filtering in the country. At that stage, the government's attempt to rein in the Runet was quite clumsy, and users could easily circumvent it. The Kremlin decided to combine the blacklisting policy with administrative measures, like putting social media under government control. In the spring of 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, the company Vkontakte, 
the most popular social network in Russia, modeled after Facebook, was placed under control of the Kremlin. The founder of the network, Pavel Dorov, was forced out of the country. Still, the horizontal nature of the network resisted censorship. For instance, information about Russian military involvement in the conflict in eastern Ukraine following the annexation of Crimea continued to be posted and shared on Vkontakte despite the government's attempts to hide its involvement. Since 2012, Russia found itself in an ongoing standoff between the government and the undesired online activity of the people. Internet freedom became an essential part of the fight for political freedom. When the Kremlin realized that repressions against users and new filtering systems did not work as expected, it tasked its censorship agency, Roskomnadzor, to create a new effective tool. In November 2019, the Sovereign Internet Law introduced a new traffic managing system in Russia. This system, operated from the specially built command center in Moscow, enables the authorities, among other things, to switch off or slow down the internet in specific regions of the country, or separate those regions from the rest of the country, something they had tested during protests in Ingushetia the previous autumn. It is also capable of slowing down the traffic of particular services, like it did with Twitter in the spring of 2020. One year later, the new traffic managing system became fully operational. The Kremlin also wants its citizens to rely on Russian-made services and applications, to communicate via Russian social media platforms, as opposed to Facebook, Twitter, or TikTok, to watch videos on Russian-made platforms instead of YouTube, and to search for information using Russian-provided services. That way, the government can inculcate its desired reality into the Russian people. The Russian authorities have already made domestic search engine Yandex the default choice on smartphones sold in Russia. Starting in 2022, according to the guidelines already issued by the Ministry of Education, Russian teachers and school administrators will be able to communicate with parents and children only through Russian social media platforms. Meanwhile, foreign platforms find themselves under growing pressure from the Kremlin. The Kremlin is also encouraging the development of a Russian alternative to YouTube. Officials are placing their hopes on RuTube, a project funded by the Gazprom Media Group, which is controlled by business tycoons close to Putin. The real intent of the campaign comes through clearly from the man who has chosen to lead the RuTube project, Alexander Zharov, the former head of Roskomnadzor, Russia's internet censorship agency. At a meeting with Russian media editors in February 2020, Putin hinted that he was willing to consider banning the operation of some global platforms in Russia, but that he would only do so once the country had domestic equivalents. That moment has almost arrived. By 2021, 85% of the population was online, and Russian online platforms had been thriving. This is exactly what the government counts on. If traditional administrative control fails, as it usually does in Russia, Digitalization is there to fix things, or so the Kremlin's technocrats tend to believe. Today's government is offering a broad range of user-friendly online services which save the customer's time, but this comes at a cost. The citizen's dependence on those services leaves them subject to state surveillance. Civil society and the state are caught in a permanent standoff. Civil society is trying to fight back as evidenced by the upsurge throughout 2019 and 2020 in investigative journalism, which relies on extensive use of digital methods both in collecting data and in spreading its message. The government, however, responded with a major crackdown on online speech in general, and on online media in particular. Russia's war in Ukraine accelerated two major trends in Russia's internet and digital policy. So from one side, it has led to increased state control over the internet or the information flow within Russia. And it also forced uh, the state to switch to domestic technologies. Russia's state wanted to control the internet already for many years, and it has established a certain system to control information, to control a uh, certain website and media, uh, but it has not reached the total control over the Russia's internet and other um, Russia's um, and of the information that in Russia. 
And with the war, we observed that uh, the state has progressed in blocking uh, several media websites, social media platforms, um, and at the same time, we see that uh, Russia's state is forced uh, to switch to domestic technology, to domestic services, uh, because of their US technological sanctions and because of their massive exodus of Western companies out from the Russian market. So, um, and we see that in both cases, Russia is not well prepared, uh, even if it means a lot of troubles for Russian users, for Russia's economy, because they lack uh, free access to information, they lack access to advanced technologies, advanced soft and hardware. Um, but uh, Russian society and Russia's business are looking for another solution. So they try to install VPNs, uh, they try to use mirrored websites, and we lo they look for alternatives to get uh, real information, what is going on uh, in Ukraine, in the world. Uh, and we see that a lot of people are using tools to get around censorship or try to uh, to use available uh, tools to uh, to use for their business and uh, to stay in touch with people all around the world beyond Russia's borders. Mm -hmm.